We are in the third week of this series called No Perfect People Allowed, and I have just been having a ball with this series. It has just been awesome. Uh, I've been enjoying uh, communicating and teaching. I've enjoyed hearing your responses. Over the last three weeks, uh, we have had five people give their lives to Christ, um, which is just awesome. I mean, that's why we're here. And uh, uh, so it's just awesome to see that. So we've got a few more weeks left in this. So this is kind of the midweek thing. And today we're going to tackle a passage that not very many churches and pastors and preachers tackle. In fact, they kind of avoid it. Uh, it's one of the most toughest and most skipped over passages in the scriptures. Uh, we don't spend much time. It takes it takes a ton of unsettlement, as you're going to see. It just, it's kind of a disturbing passage, uh, even to those who call themselves followers of Christ. Uh, but I think it's kind of healthy. It is healthy at times to, to make us think, to kind of disturb us a little bit, to make us think or rethink things spiritually in our faith. And the question that we're going to answer this morning is, how do you know you are a Christian? I mean, everybody says they're a Christian, but how do you know? And is it for sure that you are a follower of Christ? <clears throat> Here's that passage that Jesus speaks. And again, this can kind of be a disturbing passage. Jesus says in Matthew 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, <clears throat> I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That is a tough, tough, tough passage. And the more you read it and the more you think about it, the more disturbing it gets. I mean, here's the bottom line. And the uncomfortable truth every one of us need to wrestle with. And that is, there are a lot of Matthew 7 people in church. There's a lot of Matthew 7 people walking around calling themselves Christian. People who talk like Christians, do Christian things. They even think they are Christian, but they are not Christian. They are not a follower of Christ. They do Christian things on the outside, but they have not been transformed on the inside. Now, to answer the big question, how do I know I am a Christian? To answer that question, we're actually going to ask and answer a couple more, a couple other questions. And the first question that we are going to ask and answer is the question, am I real? To look in the mirror and ask yourself the question, am I real? You know, I grew up in the mountains of Montana, and I grew up where cowboys were cowboys. I mean, there were ranches and cows and, and cattle and, and horses, I mean, everywhere. I mean, we went to the rodeo, and, and, and you, when you had a town parade, 90% of it was horses and pooping all over the place. And, but it was, it was the, the, the territory of cowboys. Well, there was also what we call drugstore cowboys. The drugstore cowboy was someone who dressed like a cowboy, wore the cowboy hat and the cowboy boots, and had this, this big buckle, you know, and they, they looked like a cowboy, but they didn't know the front end of a horse to the back end of a horse. They didn't know what a ranch was. They wouldn't be able to pick out a cow in the field from a deer. I mean, we call them drugs. They looked like a cowboy, but they were not cowboys. Jesus says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says they are a Christian is a Christian. Not everyone who says they are going to heaven are going to heaven. I mean, there are, there are people in churches today. They look like Christians. They talk like Christians. They have, they, they might even have fish on the back of their car. And 
but they, and they have it all together. But they've never embraced Jesus as Savior. They can go to church all their lives in their Sunday dress-up clothes, driving their Sunday cars, singing the Sunday songs after they've eaten their Sunday breakfast. They stand up and sing, but they are not the real deal. And to be honest, a lot of people have a problem with this, especially, especially in our community where going to church is considered a major step to heaven. I mean, people will say, I have a real problem with this. That someone can go to church all their lives, they can give money to the church, they can teach in the church, they can serve on committees, and they do all that stuff. They can be a good church person and not go to heaven when they die. Now, if you grew up in the church, you can probably name some of the 12 disciples. I mean, there's some of the disciples that we all know. I mean, you can name them, you come up with Peter and James and John, and, and then there's one that everybody knows, and that's Judas. Uh, Judas was the treasurer of the disciples. He was in charge of the money. Now think with me on this. Who, ask yourself this question. Who do you put in charge of the money? You always put in charge the person who is most respected has a good reputation, and who you trust the most. You don't put the person who messes up. You don't put the person who, who has a pride problem or who doubts. I mean, they weren't going to put someone in charge of the money who was doubting what Jesus said. Judas was in charge of the money. Most likely, he could have been the most trusted disciples. He was the guy that if people looked at the 12 disciples and said, you know, if there's anyone who's going to make it to heaven, it's Judas. But if you're familiar with the scriptures, you know that Judas was not the follower of Jesus. I mean, he looked like the real deal, but he wasn't the real deal. Judas spent more intimate time and moments with Jesus than any of us in here ever have. But he still missed Jesus because he had not embraced him as Savior and Lord. So Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. In other words, there's going to be a lot of people <clears> they are going to say, wait a minute, Jesus, I taught Sunday school. I was an usher. I, 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 I gave money to the church. I was a member of the church. I chaperoned the youth group. I went on a mission trip. Jesus, I sang in the choir. I mean, look at all this stuff I did, Jesus. And Jesus will say, I don't know you. So we need to ask the question, am I real? Are you real? Are you the real deal? I mean, even if you call yourself a follower of Christ, you need to ask yourself the question, am I the real deal? The second question is, am I born again? Now, am I born again? Just hang on. Don't get all, you know, don't blow a gasket or anything on this. Let me explain. You know, born again... Many people, when they hear the term born again, they think of these crazy Christians who do stupid things and they do more harm and they push people away from God than they do good. They think there's born again Christians are these ultra pushy, ultra out of touch people. In fact, they think there's two classifications of Christians. There's the normal Christian and then there's the born again Christian. The truth is, born again, when you understand what Jesus means, is an exciting, awesome thing. When you understand it from God's word, not man's word, it's, it's not referring to some crazy, pushy behavior of some Christians. The statement, born again, actually comes 
from the words of Jesus in John chapter 3. Where Jesus says this, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Now, a couple of things to help us understand this and get a grip on this. Everybody in this room, including myself, has been born into a human family. Being born into a human family is not being born into God's family. To be born into God's family, to become a Christian, you have to be born a second time. You have to be born spiritually. You have to be born again. And not everyone is born again. Only those who choose to follow Christ are born again. Again, there are, some say there are Christians and then there are born again Christians. Not so. A person cannot be a Christian unless he or she is born again. Now, a couple of things, again, to about birth that give us an amazing, very cool understanding of what it means to be born again. The first thing to really think about is that birth begins with an interest. Birth begins with an interest. I mean, believe it or not, your parents at least one time had a very intimate interest in each other. And if you have brothers and sisters... They had this interest more than once. You might be thinking, that's gross, John. My parents? To be born physically, someone else had to have an interest in giving you physical life. And the awesome thought is to be born spiritually, to be born again God had an interest in you. Being born again is not something crazy. It's not something freaky. It is something awesome and cool to think that the eternal God, the all-powerful, all-knowing, creator God, the God of all gods, the Lord of all lords, the King of all kings, had an interest in you and wanted you And wants you to be part of his family. To give you spiritual life. To give you eternal life. Second thing is, birth has a definitive point. A starting point. Birth has a definitive starting point. Newsflash. You were not always a human being. I mean, there was a point in... In time, when you went from being unborn to born. And what do we call that? What do we call that? We call that the birthday. You know, my birthday is June 20th. I was born in... I'm 29 years old, give or take 20 years. 30. Whoa. Whoa. The day before I was born, I was unborn. My existence as a human being began at a definitive starting point. You know, some people will say, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. That's like saying, I've always been a human being. In fact, someone who says, I've always been a Christian, probably doesn't understand or has never been born again. Being born into the human family has a definitive starting point. Being born again into God's family has a definitive starting point. There was a time, those of you who are followers of Christ, there was a time when you were not a Christian. You were not part of God's family. Then you made a choice, intentionally chose to surrender to Christ And at that point, you were born again. So my question to you is, 
Have you experienced that born again starting point? You know, when was it that you realized that you cannot on your own get right with God? That Christ paid for your sin, that he died on the cross for you, and that for you to be right with God, you needed to trust him and surrender to him and invite him into your life as your savior. It's not getting baptized, it's not being confirmed, it's not church membership. Have you been born again? Are you someone who says, well, I've always been a Christian? Or was there a definitive starting point in your life, in your relationship with God? The third thing is birth lasts forever. Now, please hear me on this because this is a point of disagreement with a lot of people. But listen to what the scriptures say. Once you are born into the human family, once you are born into the human race, you never stop existing, even after you die. Christianity, we believe that after you die, you will continue to exist either in heaven or in hell. And you cannot take a step backwards and become unborn. Now, again, some will object to this truth. It's called the doctrine of eternal security, or the big word is the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. And basically it means once you are born again, once you become a follower of Christ, once you become a Christian, you can never step back into an unborn condition. You can never become unchristian again. I mean, again, the illustration, think about this, is those of you who are parents and you have young children, you want them to grow up and you want them to, to be faithful. You want them to trust. You want them to be good citizens and, and treat people and be kind and follow God. You want, you want them to do things that will be better in life and make, life, make a difference in life. But there will come a day when they don't always make those right choices. In fact, for some, there might come a time when they totally reject how you've brought them up and what your desire for their life is. They might even do something horrible and break your heart. Well, will, will your daughter ever cease to be your daughter? Will your son ever cease to be your son? No. No matter what she does, no matter what he does, she will always be your daughter. Now, she will do things that break your heart and create tension and break your fellowship, but the daddy-daughter or the daddy-son relationship will never be broken, right? If you have been born again, you never have to surrender to Christ. I mean, you have to surrender to Christ every day, but you never have to receive him initially. I mean, that would be like me telling my daughter who comes back to me and says, can I be your daughter again? I would respond to you, what do you mean? You're, you've never ceased being my daughter. So two questions that we need to ask ourselves. Number one, am I real? Am I the real deal? When I look in the mirror, Am I really a follower of Christ? And the second question, am I born again? And again, this is a tough passage, and maybe this message is maybe one that's tough to listen to and really make you think. But I don't want anybody here who, who calls Meadow Spring their church home, I don't want anybody to be a Matthew 7 person. I mean, when you read this verse about Jesus saying, I never knew you, you can call me Lord, Lord, all you want. You can do this and do that, and you can do it even do it in my name, but I never knew you. When you read that, it, does it create tension and fear in your heart? I mean, if it does, you need to seriously think about whether you really are a Christian. I mean, and if there's a, any kind of question in your mind, maybe this morning... You just need to nail it down. Don't leave here thinking, maybe, or I'm not sure. 
No, I want you to leave here thinking and knowing, yes, I am Christian. Or, no, I'm not. Do you know Jesus is alive in you? And you could respond with, yes, I am the real deal. Maybe not on the outside. I am imperfect, as we talked about, you know, no perfect people allowed. I am, I am imperfect on the, on the outside. I got a lot of things I need to work on and get right, and I am far from perfect. I'm a work in progress, but yes, I have surrendered to Christ, and I've turned my life over to Jesus, and I am following him. He is the center of my life. Yes, I have been born again. I made that decision at a definitive point in life to give my life to Christ. I was born into a human family, and I have been born again into God's spiritual family. And like I said, if you're not 100% certain, why don't you nail it down right now this morning, and you can leave here 100% certain? today. Today could be the definitive point. I mean, you walked in here unborn. You can make the decision right now, right here, at this moment, to be born again. And you can leave having been born again into God's family. And don't let pride hold you back. You might be thinking, wow. People think I'm a Christian. What will they say? People, people, I mean, I've been coming to church forever. But I've never been born again. Don't let pride hold you back. Don't let what people think about you or say about you hold you back. I'm even going to say, Don't let unanswered questions hold you back. There's always going to be questions that we can't answer. If we could answer all the questions, we'd be God. So how do you you go from being unborn to born? It's not complicated. It's not complex. It's simply a matter of surrendering to Christ and talking to Him and Receiving him and saying, Jesus, I I haven't been born again. So today I surrender to you. Forgive me of trying to do this on my own. For thinking I am what I'm not. I'm going to pray a prayer. A prayer of surrender, a prayer of invitation. And as I pray out loud, if you would like to surrender to Christ and if you would like to be born again at this definitive moment, then as I pray out loud, right where you're sitting, just silently repeat after me. And this could be the definitive moment where you go from being unborn and not a part of God's family to being born again. And you leave here as part of God's family. Let's pray. Bow your heads, please. Father, at this moment, right here, right now, I surrender to you. I give my life to you. Forgive me for trying to do this on my own. Thank you for Jesus, for his death on the cross. Thank you that I can now be part of God's family. Thank you that I can walk out of here knowing I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen. Now do me a favor. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time and you just surrendered to Christ and you just, that was your definitive moment and you're going to walk out of here born again, if you did that for the first time, I want you to take your communication card and I want you to put the letter A, big letter A on the back. I will get that. I will respond to you. 
We want to help you do everything possible to help you discover and learn and live a refreshing relationship with Christ. Second, maybe you're saying, you know, I want to come back next week. I'm going to come back next week. Would you put the letter B? Because again, I'll get that and we will pray for you. I use these communication cards throughout the week to be praying for you. Or, and, maybe you're saying, I'm coming back next week and I'm inviting someone to come with me. Put the letter C on the back. And even if you want to put the name of someone that you're inviting, we will pray for you, we will pray for that person, and we'll see great things happen. A, B, or C. Let's stand. Close. If you ever have questions about a relationship with Christ or questions about the Bible, don't hesitate to ask. We don't have all the answers, but we'll help you discover. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that the tomb is empty and that we can be born again when we give our lives to you. Give us a great day, a great week. Bring us back next Sunday to once again worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming. Have a great day.